can we start uh it gives me immense pleasure today uh, to kick start the sigana spotlight series event uh i'm so happy uh, to have uh, two wonderful people joining us today uh, navin fola from uh, chicago and uh, kumaresh padaviraman from uh, bay area uh, this has been a, a, a dream for us to start this event and uh, i'm so glad we are the first and many more to come i want to thank everyone today uh, who's been part of this uh, in the front behind uh, and supporting all through uh finally i also uh, thank all the uh, participants and listeners today who have joined us uh without uh, you all it would not be uh, a success so keep supporting us and uh, the the new events we are uh, please send us suggestions uh, uh, we want to work with many of you all thank you now i'm handing over to navin uh, to start the conversation Thank you, KG. Uh, good morning to everybody watching. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be a part of this uh, fireside chat series, and it even gives me greater pleasure to be talking to one of my good friends, uh, Kumaresh. So, to give you some background, uh, Kumaresh and I were in CEG from the period of 2003 to 2007, and then it so happens Kumaresh decided to choose. uh uiuc for his masters i followed him a year after and i ended up at uiuc and we were roommates for a year so that is that is how i know him and uh, as far as his uh, professional introduction goes today he is the director of product at linkedin he has held roles at uh, bing search and he as i mentioned he has a bachelor's in computer science from cg a masters in computer science from uh, uiuc Kumaresh, I'm really gra- glad to have you on board and kickstart this uh, Sigana Spotlight series, and you being one of our prominent uh, alumni. Thanks, Kogi. Um, they say there are few people that know you as well as your roommate, so <laughs> I'm so glad <laughs> to uh, to kick this off with you. Sure. Uh, so yeah. So let's let's uh, you know get on with. Uh, the few things that uh, i wanted to you know talk to you about maybe start off with your uh, academic journey you know cg to uiuc i mean sounds like a long time ago i mean it's been 10 years since since you left the academic world and uh, entered the industry but uh, the first question would be uh, what what role do you think uh, cg played uh, you know the four years at cg played uh, in in shaping your uh, career how, how how have those four years affected or benefited you um obviously the program uh, and faculty were were awesome mm-hmm. uh, but looking back uh, i've got to say there are two things that i didn't quite appreciate then uh, that i've come to realize have really shaped uh, my career and the choices i made really um the first one is the community uh almost every step of the way and and by community i'm i'm referring to everyone that was part of the the, the cg fabric mm-hmm. uh no almost every step of this way um and i'll, I'll give you a few examples i've had a, a cg alumni help me in some form um either with making a career choice or with opening up an opportunity that i didn't that i didn't even know existed uh but there's that there's also the group of people that you you went to school with i see mm-hmm. eve is on the call um yeah uh this foggy and then um you know close friends of mine that really mm-hmm. helped uh, me through 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 those four years um one one example that i i can distinctly remember that made this come to life was google uh was this relatively you know new name so it was just mm-hmm. one year post ipo and they they were starting a, a, a an office in bangalore and understandably they went to all the iits and then to bits for hiring interns um for that first year and there was one alumni uh, her her name is deepa uh, she chose to uh, to make a case for them to come to cg 
and i happened to be a second year student then and mm. uh, i remember doing the interview with her like so as part of the interview she was part of my interview panel mm-hmm. and i bombed it big time uh, you know second year um, and she was like look man it, it's taken a lot of effort for us to bring google over to cg and we expect better from our students um she gave me a good like 15 minutes of guidance then which really shaped uh my my life choices since then mm-hmm. uh, and subsequently the next year she was also a mentor for me uh, at google so that's uh just like one example and of course we'll talk about more mm-hmm. nice uh and uh, in, i mean yeah you mentioned uh, for example deepa being uh, like a mentor uh, if you if you talk about uh, you know faculty any any particular faculty from cg be it computer science or any department or anybody who who had a faculty role at cg who left a lasting impact or you know if you think of cg this is the person that springs to mind immediately yeah uh now i i would like to mention that i do not want to put you on the spot where you take one faculty names and there are five others who are like why didn't he talk about me so if you want to side step this question i can completely understand <laughs> no man these are um start with dr sekar dr munasami mm-hmm. sekar um a former dean so i had the pleasure of taking the engineering mechanics class with him in my very first nice. year nice and man like the the passion that he brought to his craft was mm-hmm. just phenomenal uh nice. it really set the tone for uh for those four years mm-hmm. he is one that immediately comes to mind and then in computer science there are two people that really um that really left a lasting impact the first one is uh, dr uma maheshwari mm-hmm. uh she in that third year uh, did an algorithms class that really um like it, it helped us understand what these software engineers do um mm-hmm. at, at large companies uh and she eventually became my my advisor as well mm-hmm. uh and then another uh another professor dr ranjini patsarthi was uh phenomenal the one thing about dr ranjini is is just she helped me realize how cg as a spa- like a, a, as a college was making uh it was making access to education happen at a scale that i didn't quite realize because i had gone to schools like mm-hmm. psbb in chennai mm-hmm. uh, where you you generally find students that are all from chennai and then mm-hmm. you go to cg and you realize that there are students from rural parts of tamil nadu um including students that have been phenomenal academically uh, but in tamil medium mm-hmm. that are coming here and are thriving like it's a struggle initially but yes. over time they just become amazing and i've seen what that has done in terms of what that access to education has done to them eventually like the, mm-hmm. the economic and the social mobility that it's given them uh, that in many ways has influenced choices i've made subsequently like working mm-hmm. at linkedin Mm, nice that's yeah that 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 impact is actually quite big and i don't know as a, as an undergrad student you don't tend to realize it then but when you step back and look at the bigger picture it yeah it, it makes quite an impact i i completely agree with you there uh okay uh let's switch gears a little so now talking at uh, uiuc what what was one big difference in the education style or content that you noticed you know between cg and uiuc and you were like man if i had that back when i was an undergrad it would have even made you know a bigger difference or would have helped guide me better um i felt the the masters program at uiuc and i think most masters programs here they have they, they allow you to make the program what you want it to be mm-hmm. like if you remember foggy uh that summer uh mm-hmm. when i was just like a little bit clueless on what i wanted to do and yeah. i just dropped into a couple of classes like one in finance uh, mm-hmm. and another in um 
another in design um, no. and i was like I, i didn't even know that you you could do these things like mm-hmm. you know, a masters in computer science yeah um, and that summer i ended up interning at a hedge fund in yes. chicago called yeah. citadel they right? mm-hmm. in many ways opportunities like that i like open up when you create a program that is holistic that gives you choice and allows you to explore paths that mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know to to an university's credit. I I just don't to to CEG's credit. I I don't think an undergrad program can avoid like can offer that kind of flexibility. Mm-hmm. But um, it's one thing that I'd love to see the yeah. land uh, in uh, in India eventually offer. Uh, and then there's obviously like the the practical aspect of education, which is you you end up applying almost anything you learn. Mm-hmm. Um, as an yeah. example for 3 years uh in cg i didn't have a computer like a laptop mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and you're studying computer science so all the coding that you would do would be on paper right mm-hmm. um and then you go to to uiuc and um uh, day 1 you, you you're given an assignment that requires you to like build something right yeah 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 uh I also I also always got a feeling I don't know like I, I spent most of my grad school uh, teaching undergrads you know as as part of funding and I always thought that undergrads here are definitely more fearless when it comes to tackling any problem given to them you know like even if it is an unknown problem which doesn't have a well defined solution at least I keep thinking that if I was given the same problem back when I was an undergrad I would have freaked out as opposed to people here with the confidence that they present a solution even if the solution is completely wrong doesn't matter but the level of confidence which they which with they come out is is phenomenal I, I don't know have you have you noticed this uh, you know over your time as you know as a grad student or even right now you know when you interact with people when you interview people when you come across undergrads man hundred percent like yeah it, it would be phenomenal if you know if if something like this could be figured out to you know translate back home yeah uh now coming back you know to to your uh, current current profile you know director of product at linkedin what what does that entail you know what is what is your typical day like or to put it very bluntly what do you do as director of product at linkedin <laughs> it's a little bit all over the place so uh, okay. the, the role product management uh, the, like so the function uh, mm-hmm. in itself is a little bit of a jack and jack of all trades okay uh, in that uh, so it takes a village to build a product even mm-hmm. in the digital world and you have engineers designers data scientists uh marketers and then even non r&d functions right finance mm-hmm. operations legal uh mm-hmm. how do you bring all of these functions together to build a product um mm-hmm. and how do you make sure that product has a road map um and a vision for where you want to take it and how does that vision translate to uh your company's vision like how mm-hmm. do you see the dots connecting between the two that's i guess in as many fuzzy words uh what a director product does and uh, now i i lead teams of product managers okay. uh, and a typical day uh starts with looking at the health of the the product you lead as well as the company so okay. you i end up waking up to a dashboard um and and then uh through the course of the day it's really rallying these teams uh to work closely and uh in, in many ways it's defining the what and the how of of products okay nice uh and this is something uh, a, lo- a lot of people who are currently mid career you know maybe 2 3 years into their uh, job life uh or even a little longer i mean this deals with you know when you transition from being an individual contributor to somebody who's responsible for a group of people maybe even a two, team of 2 3 it kind of starts affecting you because now you are in this in this weird situation where you are not contributing as much individually as you are used to uh, 
which you know at least to yourself is sort of your performance metric or at the end of the day how much did i do or what like for example if you're writing code you know how much code did i write at the end of the day that is your typical performance metric as an individual contributor but now you are suddenly you know responsible for a team of people and during the day people are asking you questions you're uh, helping them out you're guiding them you are uh, teaching them things to do that you could have done in like 5 minutes and moved on but you know new people have to be trained and these are things that are sometimes very hard to quantify and then at the end of the day you leave with the feeling that what did i do you know or what what contribution so my question is how did you adjust when this transition happened and were there any resources that helped you like in terms of mentors or books or something that told you maybe there's a method to all this there's a method to do this transition more effectively you know how, what was that process like and they say you know as you grow in your career you go from writing code to mm -hmm. write writing documents to writing uh -huh. decks to eventually writing email um <laughs> and that's <laughs> <laughs> you know a big part of your day ends up being email with uh -huh. about communication um yeah. the the transition the first transition from being an individual contributor to leading a small team managing mm -hmm. a small group of either engineers or product mm -hmm. managers that was relatively straightforward for me um, okay. because it felt i could continue to play this like player coach role Mm -hmm. where you you are continuing to spend a good 20 to 30% of your time contributing as an individual in addition mm -hmm. to managing the team mm -hmm. the the harder transition uh for me was uh the next step which is um uh, going from managing a small team of individual contributors to managing managers uh ah, okay uh, in that now you're talking about developing leaders and mm -hmm. making uh, and giving them guidance that's at a level that also allows them to apply their unique style of leadership and that's where uh, i struggled quite a bit initially uh, and thankfully had lots of mentors around to help me okay that's nice that's nice yeah and uh, you know if you if you look back on your almost 10 years or longer of professional life what would be you know one of your biggest achievements that you you know that you know sticks in memory like you know this was something i'm still proud of till this date that i achieved uh, professionally man like this question really makes us feel old foggy uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and there was kg yesterday talking about how he doesn't know orkut uh, and audio cassette <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't believe we are already in an alumni conversation. Um, I know. Yeah. The the one thing that I, I'm personally like proud of, I uh, take a lot of satisfaction from is founding the Careers team at LinkedIn. Okay. So mm -hmm. some context here. For all of us, we think of LinkedIn as this place that helps you find jobs, right? Yes. For the average American, they did not know that LinkedIn had jobs. Mm. they thought of linkedin as a social network so a uh -huh. facebook for work uh, yes. so more specifically a facebook for people in suits that mm -hmm. you know connect with each other so high end you know white white collar workers yeah. uh, and it it was very clear to me even through my own experience that the access to opportunity through linkedin was just unprecedented uh, in mm -hmm. that it's just not this job board alone uh, no in a in a typical job board you end up searching for jobs and then applying to them and then waiting to hear a response from a faceless entity like a company yeah, yeah. right on linkedin you had this this community of people that can help you land that job you can ask people for referrals you can reach out to alumni uh it just to me it was a new way of job seeking and it was just a big blind spot that linkedin hadn't addressed this head on mm -hmm. for starters because they didn't have a team to build products for job seekers mm -hmm. uh for me like pitching the need for that team and then eventually uh making uh making that team realize its potential was was the biggest thing like you know we 
started off as a team of about five engineers uh, building products for job seekers. And then mm-hmm. over the course of three years, we built a team of uh, nearly now, I think 150 engineers, 10 wow. product managers. Uh, we helped in 2019, uh, 5 million people get jobs. Wow. The beauty That's... of it is, is just that you are, you're actually able to measure this because mm-hmm. People look for jobs on LinkedIn and then they end up updating their profiles saying yes. they are now at this company, right? So we're yes. able to connect the dots and know that LinkedIn was instrumental in helping you land that job. So uh, when you wake up to dashboards like that, that says, hey, how many people did you help get jobs today? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it gives a lot of satisfaction. That's that's quite phenomenal, and especially in the current times. I mean, yeah, I I, I see that every time I link the open LinkedIn, there are people asking for referrals. So, I mean, I, I'm I'm pretty sure the product that you've built is playing a crucial role at this point. I mean, and I can personally attest that uh, you know my wife was looking for a job for these past four months, and LinkedIn played a crucial role in her landing a role. So, thanks to you for building the building the product that you built. <laughs> And uh, I see you commenting on people's threads, like asking for help. It goes mm-hmm. a long way, man. Thank you for doing that. I mean, it's 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 one short thing that, uh, I mean, because from my perspective, it's a matter of just writing a comment or pushing a support button. And if just that small act can help somebody find a livelihood and, you know, restart their, you know, restart their life and get their life to some sort of normalcy. I mean, why not? What is it taking me? Like a few seconds of my day? I mean, that's the least one can do. So. You know, what happens then, Foggy, by you supporting that one thread? Uh-huh. It opens up that that conversation to people okay. in your network. Yes. And now yes. see it on their feed, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how opportunities happen. So. Yes, yes, yeah. And that's that's actually, I mean, it's it, it's a proper compounding effect, right? You know, it just goes from one feed to the next to the next, and you never know when it lands up on the feed of the uh, right person. And bam, you just need that one connect. So yeah, it's it's a pretty pretty phenomenal thing. So I mean, I, everybody who's who's watching or hearing, I mean, if if you ever see somebody make a post like that on LinkedIn, just 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 click that support button. And I mean, as Kumaresh said, you never know what what it is going to end up doing. So yeah, and you know, I'm not, I'm I'm now gonna throw throw a typical. Uh, uh, interview sort of a question at you where do you where do you think you know you or where do you see your uh, your professional uh, self in the future like i mean you know like right now you've built a built a phenomenal product which is this linkedin careers which has which has helped people so if given given all the resources all the freedom and say even if you take linkedin out of the picture say you just had somebody some unicorn saying you go build the product that you want i'll give you all the funding all the resources that you want in the future what do you see yourself building or what's what's the what's the dream what's the vision like you know this is this is what i want my i know we are too young to be even asking that question but uh, if if somebody had to ask that what would you want your uh, legacy to to be or you know what would be what, what would you want your impact to be that Yes, this is one thing that I did, and now I can, you know, peacefully say that okay, I did, I achieved what I wanted to achieve in, you know, from my professional life. The, the answer to this, Foggy, keeps changing almost. I, I can imagine. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, the one one thread that I can think of. Um, so this, when I was at at Google interning uh, in my third year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was having conversations with three of our alumni, uh, mm-hmm. Deepa, Melky, and 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 Vinod, who were all like part of that early wave of mm-hmm. CG uh, grads that were at, at at Google, and they insisted that I go uh, pursue this 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 opportunity to do a, a master's and potentially mm-hmm. a PhD uh, mm-hmm. at UIUC. Uh, and as I was talking about it, I, I realized just how uh, my dad had an opportunity to like become a chartered accountant coming mm-hmm. from a village, a farming community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that access made in many ways, you know, me have better access to education. Um, mm-hmm. And then CEG obviously enabled me to come to another country. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a two-year-old um, and in many ways, I'm thinking the opportunities that he will have access to will allow him to go to Mars. 
right? Like yeah. the evolution of getting from a village to a city to a country to another planet uh, has been possible just because of, I guess, better access to education mm-hmm. opportunities. Mm-hmm. And that problem continues to be something I'm super passionate about. Now, mm-hmm. job seeking is one small aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Right, democratizing access to like education for the right skills, uh, mm-hmm. especially in an economy that's dynamically changing. Like you know, yeah. just COVID itself yeah. has changed the skills that you need to be successful dramatically, and now you need to figure out how you create world class content, right? Education mm-hmm. for uh, for for helping people build those skills. So. Yeah. Um, that's roughly the space that I, I see myself mm-hmm. continuing to to operate in. Uh, LinkedIn mm-hmm. offers me that today, uh, mm-hmm. but I think in the future I see doing something on my own. And that's nice, good. nice. That's good. Uh, changing uh, maybe gears a little bit. Uh, the 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 big uh, buzzword of this day and age, you know, machine learning slash AI, and uh, probably the first person who introduced me to this word was probably you when you took took that course at UIUC. Was it, I don't know, it, it wasn't Andrew NG, right? Because he's at Stanford. It was somebody else at UIUC, but it was one of the very early courses that was being offered in machine learning and what machine, I mean, it was in, in its infancy and it was just an academic thing. So could, could you uh, talk a little bit about what that first introduction to machine learning was like at back then and did you think that it would grow to what it has grown to now? I clearly didn't see it growing to where it is today. Uh, the funny story, uh, the, the first time I was introduced to it was much earlier when uh, so I, I, I used to play chess and mm-hmm. um, there was this first moment when a machine beat a man at a mm-hmm. sport that you would consider to be highly intellectual, right? Like it requires yes. you to, 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 to understand um, and, and be able to look ahead several moves. Um, mm-hmm. So Deep Blue defeated Caspro and mm-hmm. I was like, how is this even possible? And there's obviously a lot of what they called artificial intelligence, at which point I was like, how can intelligence possibly be artificial? Um, and, and then realized machine learning was a big part of it. Um, and that was, I think, like really a, a moment that got me excited about it. And then um, at UI, you see the range of problems that you could apply machine learning to. Uh, you know, that course really helped me realize that this is going to solve any problem that you could possibly apply it to. But uh, a, I clearly didn't realize how much of a buzzword, uh, more than a buzzword, how much of impact machine learning will have uh, in every sphere of life. I clearly didn't see it. And the second part is I didn't appreciate the challenges that that would entail. Like, um, you know, everything from how do you make sure these algorithms are doing the right thing? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I was going to reserve that for a little later, but now that you bring it in, I can perfectly segue into my next question. I mean, uh, on one side, one side you have machine learning and AI. On the other side, you have the uh, you have the documentary on Netflix, the social dilemma, where you know the ethics the ethics of AI has been a big thing. You know, uh, I mean, you you watch that documentary. I'll I'll be honest with you. I watched that documentary and I cleaned my phone of six different apps. So you know, and it 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 kind of freaks you out as to how how uh, surgically precise the whole monetization attempt is using using ai so you know what what are your views on it like you know it's it, on one hand this is a this is a technology that as you said can be used to build machines uh, doing uh, doing uh, things like beating Kasparov at chess or uh, doing medical diagnosis much accurately and much faster, you know, uh, than humans. And on the other side, the same technology is being used to, you know, target uh, humans for ad revenue or, uh, you know, potentially in- influence their decisions, you know, at uh, different matters. So what, what, what are your uh, views on that or what are your thoughts on that? 
It's scary, man. I saw that uh, documentary and I had a very similar <laughs> response. Like, uh-huh. kept the phone out of the like, I guess, bedroom for, uh-huh. yeah. and then it sneaked itself way back. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. It's crazy. Uh, so obviously, I think there are these intentional use products like mm-hmm. search and then there are these less intentional use products where an algorithm is deciding how you spend your time right um this the news feed yes like once you're on it you're just scrolling through it and mm-hmm. not realizing what like no it's not intentional because yeah, you yeah. really don't know what the next next feed post is but mm-hmm. you're just looking for that next dopamine hit mm-hmm. so there's yeah. that uh there are notifications so you know the company is deciding when to interrupt you yes um, and so there's certainly something that we need to do to to make sure well being is like a key objective that you're solving for with mm-hmm. everything in the second category of you know non intentional use products mm-hmm. but even with intentional use products like search right where it's yeah. you coming to the product and doing let's say a job search yeah 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 um one of the things i'm realizing is machine learning is perpetrating some of the biases that existed in your past so as an example if the jobs are only like that that you you get that are posted on linkedin only get recommended to people that have historically gotten those jobs um and if people that have gotten those jobs in the past weren't representative of the talent pool right for mm-hmm. example like there are diverse talent pools uh, in you know clearly in engineering for example there mm-hmm. are clearly not as as many women as we 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 need um black and latino communities um it's so the machine learning choices so the choices that an algorithm ends up making ends up perpetrating these biases to an yes. extreme extent so the one thing that we are watching out for very closely is fair ai um okay how do you correct some of these biases that uh, that exist that's one mm-hmm. part and the second part is how do you take control like at some point you know these algorithms are getting so complex that it's mm-hmm. impossible to even explain why we it chooses to do what it does yes. yeah um and and at that point i think it's just important that fairness and explainability are a key part of how we build mm-hmm. that's nice yeah it's 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 very tricky i mean uh, as you mentioned biases yeah uh, up until now at least uh, in the media you keep you keep hearing about just the racial bias that's one of the uh for the lack of a better word one of the most well known biases but as you brought it up it's it's yeah it's very interesting that even during job search the algorithm could be biased towards people who were traditionally getting the job that that's a very very interesting thought it, it had never crossed my mind but yes that's another bias that the algorithm just could choose that oh yeah that's let's assign more weight to that and just keep keep you know pushing the solution towards towards that region that's that's very interesting yeah that's very interesting to know yeah yeah so uh one last question about this whole uh, business of uh, machine learning and ai how how important or how pervasive do you think this topic is going to be like like for example uh, i remember uh, when uh, you know we were finishing high school like you know 10th grade 11th grade the most in thing to do was to go to a you know uh, like a class where you learn how to write c code or you learn how to write uh, java that was the most in thing and everybody was doing that in the break over the break so by the time you were in uh, 11th grade 12th grade or you were entering engineering most of us had already finished courses that taught us how to write code you know or at least uh, you know people who were fortunate enough to have that opportunity others they picked it up when they were in uh, for example in ceg where certain classes were offered to take on you know so do you think uh, machine learning ai down the line is going to become a skill like that where like for example when you enter grad school and you are handed assignments it's a basic assumption that you need know how to write code in at least one language and you can solve it so down the line do you see it happening that you are handed an assignment and you know i am not an expert so maybe the next statement that comes out of my mind might sound uh, stupid please correct me but say an assumption is in grad school you are given an assignment you already are expected to know how to 
work with TensorFlow, for example, to solve that assignment. Do you think that's how pervasive this is going to become? Uh, you know, uh, I have no doubt in my mind that that will happen at least over the next okay. decade. Um, mm -hmm. Take even just LinkedIn as an example. Mm -hmm. um, we have very different kinds of engineers, right? Like web engineers, mobile engineers, mm -hmm. API engineers, backend engineers, and then there are AI or machine learning engineers. Mm -hmm. um, the single biggest change I've seen over the last at least five years is this push to get every engineer to be AI trained. So uh -huh. you created programs like AI Academy that helps mm -hmm. uh, any engineer be able to pick it up and that I believe is just the start. Uh, the mm -hmm. next step is there are programs that help non-engineers pick up the application of machine learning. So mm -hmm. you still don't need to be able to code, mm -hmm. uh, but you can still apply machine learning to problems that you have in mind. And mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of time. The democratization mm -hmm. of, of it is, is happening already. Yeah. And if, if that's where we are heading, I'm guessing that topics that you mentioned before, explainability and control become even more important. Because if this is going to end up in hands of people who are non-experts and they're just expecting this, this, let's call it a black box to provide them solutions to the problems that they have in mind, then I guess it becomes even more important that this black box is fair and free of unintentional biases. And more importantly, uh, somebody can explain why the black box chose the solution that it did. Completely. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, now, now I, I would like to uh, move on to our topic and probably KG, if you want to join the call, please feel, feel free to, this is to do with chess. So, so my, my question to you is, I mean, okay, let me, let me at least give you, give you my, my first, uh, or the, the thing about uh, Kumaresh and chess that shocked me the most. And the best part is the person I'm going to, in, that involves this story is also on the call, which is Sujeev. I can never forget this moment. So there was this time uh, we were in my apartment. I think it was a weekend morning. And uh, Sujeev happened to call Kumaresh's phone. And, uh, you know, they were having a conversation. I walked in on them. And I could not believe that these people were playing a chess game on the phone with no, not a board in front of them. So Sujeev just enters something like, I don't know, D4 to E5 or something and a rook. And this guy is just responding back saying, okay, this is the follow up. That completely blew my mind. I was like, how do you, how do you play chess without a board in front of you and have all of that in your head? So, I mean, so, the, so that was that was my first or my uh, interaction with Kubrish involving chess that, that I can never forget. So how, how long have you been playing chess? You know, how, how, how long has this passion of yours been going on? <clears throat> um, Fagi, you know, trust me on this. And I told you this even then. Uh, it's when you do something for like 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. right? um, and there are only 64 squares. Um, mm -hmm it kind of becomes this thing that you end up picturizing in your head. Okay, um, yeah. and, and most people that have done it for that long um, do it. Uh, but I, I can see how um, fascinating it could be for someone yeah. looking at it. Especially for me, I had that moment when I was on a, on a flight uh, for the first time mm. and I had two people next to me and they were playing a game. And I was like, ah, yeah. uh, I was this close to just you know, thinking they may have problems with their mental health. <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, so um, clearly played it for a long time uh, mm -hmm. and started taking it up professionally. Um, and then there came this, this point where you make a decision. Um, Deep Blue had already defeated Caspero, machines mm -hmm. were winning, thought it was going to be on the winning side. <laughs> is, that, is that what motivated you to go into computer science that I, I probably cannot beat a machine, so let's just build a machine who can beat, beat everybody? Is that there's also the realization that I wasn't great at beating all humans at that point either. So. <laughs> that's nice. That's nice. So yeah, yeah. KG, do you do you want to chime in? Do you do you have uh, anything you would like to ask, Kumaresh? Please do. Yeah. So so one of the things uh, when uh, Naveen suggested uh, uh, your name, and I looked up uh, in LinkedIn, and the one thing that caught my eye was you are a coach in Chess.com. 
So that's one website I sent. I spent sometimes like hours and hours playing chess. So I was so excited for the chess connect, uh, uh, and also realized like in a busy busy schedule, someone takes time to play chess. So how does it uh, help uh, in terms of uh, your day to day, you know, work or is it is it just passion? You just don't uh, you just don't uh, think that's different. Uh, how do you get time for that? um it's i justify this to myself um you know for the number of hours that i end up spending on chess uh, that it's almost like a gym for the brain um right like you you work out your muscles and like the brain is one of those things that you need to constantly keep active you don't have to do 6 hours of it at a stretch to uh to activate the brain and i think that's where um I end up probably overdoing it. Um, the there is I found chess to be incredibly helpful in everything I do. Like you know, be it uh, with education, where it gave me a very important break from everything academic. Um, at work, I mean, a big part of what you do as you get uh, as you grow in your career is helping your company strategize, um, helping them come up with. a strategy that um allows them to be competitive in a landscape where you are where you have like several other companies that are trying to go after the same opportunity that you see and uh well chess obviously is like a two person game and this is a multiplayer game um you know in real life that you're trying to solve for your company uh i think your ability to be able to see hey if you made a certain move what will you know this company do um and this this competitor uh, and then what will that do to the entire industry and then how do you navigate that that kind of thinking has certainly helped uh, a lot in in my job nice i got to take it offline but probably i would ask you for some tips to improve myself so yeah anytime that's nice okay uh kg so we we are at the end of our planned 40 minutes is there uh, are there questions or anything that we should answer at this point or can i just continue uh we will open up the floor for questions uh, i think uh, uh, people might directly ask uh, i guess uh, if there is not we will continue with uh, for the questions we have okay so yeah so if anybody has a question feel free to pop in ask us or uh, if not i can continue so oh, hey guys this is aarti here thank you so much for the series and uh, thanks kumaresh for sharing your valuable insights with us today i have just uh, one more, i mean generic question uh, it's glad to know that uh, your passion also lies with uh, content creation or impact through education i just want to know your opinion why the sector is so fragmented right now why hasn't been there a single player which has come up with a disruptive solution that kind of consolidated this like say uh, google facebook linkedin or amazon for that matter that's a great question um it's something that i haven't given a lot of thought um so arti i think this this college and, and graduate education and then this continuing education that happens after you are a professional um and in the in the second space uh, almost like we see it ourselves about 70% of our revenue in running a learning business comes from the enterprise so companies choosing to invest in their workforce and reskilling their workforce so for example if you are um if you are a company that has relied on a certain skill that is being replaced by you know that is being displaced at some point by a machine that can do better than humans at that task that em- that your employees do you need to reskill your employees to be able to pick in- pick up new new skills and um your company chooses to do that by investing in a learning solution it turns out that this enterprise learning space is highly fragmented you have many different players 
uh, that are offering up solutions with none yet that are offering clearly like, I guess, category defining solutions yet. So it still feels like they're all equally competitive and you know, the content they, they create is like compelling. Um, some of them have obviously tried creating aggregators like marketplaces where they aggregate courses from across many different instructors. Um, it's a space that, that's still evolving, but I, I fully see in that continuing education space that it's got to be you know, one enterprise um, player that wins it all. And that takes time, like in, as with any other enterprise uh, business, it, it could take like a, a decade or more before we see that kind of a clear player emer emerging. And then on the, on the consumer side, um, which is you know, individuals uh, choosing to invest in learning and, and reskilling themselves, uh, I think there are some players that are starting to emerge um, that are offering value, like differentiated value. And um, uh, I can see a leader emerging there sooner than on, on the enterprise side. Yeah, thank you. I completely agree. There isn't a category king yet in this space. And like KG, I also have same request. I would like to catch up with you, I mean, later in order to discuss further about the space. Look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, this is Yogesh here. Uh, I am uh, IT 2008 uh, graduated from CG and uh, not sure if you guys remember me. I remember Kumaresh from our uh, computer SOC, ComSoc Society, where they asked us to have uh, training programs and then uh, where they will actually have this competition, programming competition. I was not good at that at all. I was, I was, um, I was, I was just learning there and it was very difficult for us to, I mean, to catch up with all the questions asked in the thing. So I have a question for uh, Kumaresh. So Kumaresh, you were saying about you wanted to remove the human bias out of the uh, decision made by AI system, but then like your training data is going to have this human bias, right? How are you going to remove the human bias from the training data? Yogesh, great question, and I can't put a face to the name just yet, so uh, if you turn on your webcam, um, and maybe you will do Yeah. Um, just uh, for a yeah. answer. So, All right, I now I remember. So, yes, <gasps> thank you. Oh, you remember? <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, thanks, Yogesh. Yeah, it's a, an incredibly hard, hard problem, man. If you have ideas, you should come join us. Um, uh, it's I think it starts with measuring bias uh, as with anything else. Like, how do you know that the choices made by uh, an algorithm uh, is perpetrating a bias? So in, in, our, in our world, uh, one thing we are starting to do uh, and we aren't there yet um, and having solved it is representativeness. So if you, let's just take uh, designers in Chicago as a talent pool um, where you're trying to hire a designer in Chicago and you have a talent pool available. Uh, this talent pool has a certain characteristic to it, like 40% um, you know, Caucasian, 30% Asian, 30% you know, a mix of like several other uh, races. Um, and then it has like, let's just say a 60, 40 male to female ratio. Um, and then the, uh, the choices made by this algorithm for some reason is giving, is, is distributing that opportunity to white males 70% of the times. Uh, clearly that is indicative of a bias uh, in that you, you knew that you had a talent pool of about 60% non-Caucasian and 40% females that you could have distributed that opportunity at that same ratio, right? So we are starting to like just understand why the algorithm is choosing to do what it does. And a lot of it is pointing to this bias in the training data that you, you pointed out. Um, and the, the only way you solve this is by ensuring that you have guardrails 
um, in play. Like the only way you start to solve this is by ensuring you you measure it and then you have guardrails in place that correct unintended biases uh, by an algorithm. Oh, thank you so much for that answer. Yeah. One more question I had on, uh, like, as a director of uh, product management in LinkedIn, do we get to use the game theory uh, on your, or linear programming or optimization algorithms in your everyday day to day planning? Or does it work? I mean, how does it work? No, man. I wish that will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one, of the down, one of the downsides of going into a management role, right? It's uh -huh. funny, the, the only thing I can think of that I use on a daily basis is like basic addition and multiplication. Um, <laughs> so so much for your training in engineering, math one, math two, math three, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think- I, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Yes, ma'am. So with the with the Ask a CEGN mentorship program and then the English communication uh, mentoring and coaching program, we get to meet a lot of current CEG students. And if I were to take a message from you to them about how to navigate their career uh, careers and and also be successful and the successful has to be defined by them, not by anybody else. Uh, what uh, one or two things that I can take back to them? Good. Great question, ma'am. Uh, I... I mean, just reflecting on, 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 on my own journey, uh, I've, I've got to say, and this is like a problem that I try to solve as a day job, um, but helping people understand the power of the community. Um, it's, it's hard to realize, like I myself didn't realize that when I was a student uh, at, at CEG, uh, but looking back, uh, as I mentioned initially, every opportunity that I've had uh, is in some form made possible by a CGN. Uh, be it during my internships, be it at Microsoft, be it at UIUC. Um, I think the, I think our alumni community uh, for starters is extremely powerful. Um, I would just start with thinking of this community as like a group of friends that can offer help. Um, when you're faced with a career choice of, hey, should I pursue graduate education? Um, should I, you know, kind of take company, like, take a job at company X or Y? Um, I think choices like this are um, something your your alums have made several times in their in their lives and uh, are in a position to help you think through it. They won't make the choices for you. You'll still be the one making it, but uh, consulting with them can be extremely powerful because they may end up giving you perspectives that inform your choices, but what's even more powerful is they may open doors you didn't even know existed. Um, and you know, maybe like you go in asking, hey, should I do X or Y? And they say, hey, you know what? Like there's this opportunity, um, Z at this company uh, that you should be like looking at. Um, that's like for me, the number one thing they should be uh, looking to do. Thank you, Kumresh. Uh, I see uh, Anna P has raised her hand. So Anna, you could unmute, ask your question. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, I have a two part question. Uh, first one is um, I enjoy search. Um, so my question is, uh, would you say that your experience on Bing had a big influence on LinkedIn? Awesome. Uh, Anna, by the way, what's the second part? Okay. <laughs> okay. Because I'm asking about search because I built search on Equinix platform modeling after LinkedIn search. So uh, sorry, could you repeat that? I, had some I modeled LinkedIn search in what I built 
on another platform. So I truly enjoyed how uh, search worked on LinkedIn. So that was why I was asking this question. Let me tell the second question. Um, can you share your insight on LinkedIn careers? Uh, what you see from your role during this pandemic? Both great questions. Uh, the first one, um, no question that like being shaped in many ways um, what what I do at LinkedIn. Um, in fact, I, I joke with a bunch of friends. I, I moved from Microsoft to LinkedIn and then Microsoft bought LinkedIn for $26 billion and I was telling them that's an expensive price to pay. They could have just like bought me for much cheaper. So um, the, the Bing experience, uh, offered me, uh, I guess, a glimpse into what it takes to run search at scale across uh, thousands of search intents. So you know, when you are searching on Bing, it's a generic web search engine like Google, where you can, you could be searching for like, you know, images, videos, news, finance, commerce, any of these. Uh, when I came to LinkedIn, the one thing I realized was that what LinkedIn did was just people search, you know, finding each other and connect with each other. Um, and I realized that there was so much untapped potential for the platform in that the moment you light up job search, learning search, right, ability to, to find skills, group search, finding communities that you should be a part of, like our alumni network, um, you know, post search, understanding what people are posting about a topic, um, I realized just how much more powerful the platform could become for, for our users. And uh, in many ways, I ended up using the playbooks that I learned at Bing to create that kind of discovery uh, on the LinkedIn search platform by lighting up each of these use cases and like, scaling the, the search experience. Um, as for the second one, what impact do I see from COVID? Uh, it's it's very clear that uh, during these seven months, you've had some some kind of a, a, a V shape um, as an economy, which is that you had a massive drop in like jobs being posted on the platform, and then you've seen a, a great recovery. Uh, I would say even beyond pre-COVID levels. So that's the good news. Uh, in terms of what's keeping me up at night is that that recovery uh, has happened. When you, when you take closer, a closer look at that recovery, it's people with um, what we, we consider high skilled workers. So people with college degrees that have advanced skills that have been a big part of that recovery. Um, and when you look at the other strata of the economy, um, people like we consider frontline workers and middle skilled workers, uh, frontline workers being you know, anyone that doesn't require a, a four year professional college degree um, and middle skilled workers being anyone that requires a diploma. So it still requires a special skill, but, um, uh, but not necessarily a four year college degree to do your, your work. So this includes, um, you know, like fire, uh, so I think it includes like several missions set up plan. Yeah. yeah, it's a great example. Um, for that segment, it's still on the way down. So, it, you know, what originally started off like a V-shaped recovery seems more like a K-shaped recovery in that there's one, one audience that's going up and the other audience that's continuing to go down from like the COVID impact. And so, um, we need to figure out how we solve this problem because the truth is LinkedIn has historically catered to that audience that's on its way up, right? Um, in fact, we hear from the, the second audience that they find it intimidating to be on the platform because the first question we ask them is, um, hey, which college did you go to? And they're like, what is this platform? Like, why would I, you know, maybe this is not for me, right? Uh, and so it's, it's something that we need to solve. Thank you. Great answer. All right. Uh, so we are almost like, actually we are on the dot of the hour and we have 
two more at least i can see two more hands so kg you tell me do we continue or do we stick to our one hour slot and we end the conversation here and maybe those questions can be asked to kumresh offline i'll i'll leave the decision to you kg oh uh, i would love to continue a little bit so we 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 have those answers uh, for these people who have joined so uh, okay with uh, kumresh and us well Yeah, I'm fine, Kumresh. Okay, I got the thumbs up from Kumresh. So Anand Jayakumar, I I saw your hand uh, up for a long time. You could unmute, ask your question. Welcome on board. Yep. Uh, thanks, Naveen and Kumresh. Uh, I'm Anand. I graduated from CG in 2013, and uh, Naveen, you might not remember this, but I contacted you back in 2012 out of the mm-hmm. blue, asking for suggestions for grad school. So this is a very helpful. Thank you. All right. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Kumarish. One question I had is like I've been working for two years now, and a uh, school seemed much more linear. Like you take this exam, like strategizing was uh, it, it, it was relatively simple. Whereas with work, there seems there seems to be so many things to do, but each one has so many dependencies, and especially like even going from an individual contributor to a managerial position, it seems. it seems tricky to navigate so what are your thoughts on that and uh, yeah what are your suggestions or career advice especially for someone in their early stage of career great question anand i i i struggle with this uh, i struggled with this a lot like the structure that um that you have in place all the way through to even like completing grad school and then you're out in the in the like wild world with no such structure it's you defining i guess your career path forward um i personally found myself looking at um at people um so take linkedin for example uh, we have a, a stellar executive team and i would look at some of them and pick a trait or two and i would say uh eventually i see myself um still being authentically myself but incorporating in that new version of me that trait that i see in this person um in that like you know that's how you end up modeling your um your evolution as a as a leader um you know as you grow in your career you end up finding role models and then finding and and obviously they have their strengths and then they have their areas where they have opportunities to grow and you end up picking those strengths and want to be like i want to be as good as them at that um for me that helped at the very least uh give me something to work towards in each of the dimensions that i felt were important in shaping me um as an example you know uh, our ceo jeff um garrick uh, ceo uh, jeff is um one of the the most influential communicator as i've seen like his ability to own a room no matter how big um it is um and be able to inspire that room is phenomenal and i was like uh man one day i want to be owning a room like jeff um and then you would see uh, an an alan who's a founder uh, who would tell me um how he envisioned linkedin on day one and be like and he continues to uh, to present strategies that to me seem like they are 50 years away and i feel like one day i want to build a vision in my head for what this thing could be um the way an island does um i think once you start identifying those things and obviously there are a lot of these so it's important that you prioritize and pick those dimensions that you want to get better at but i think it it ends up creating that structure it's still not quite the same as like hey you know i had spent three semesters on this and like is is it with an a um but uh, eventually it helps you work towards these dimensions that you identify thanks that that, that is really helpful i think it's interesting that you pointed out look at skills or qualities in people you would emulate as opposed to look at different job opportunities and apply randomly so so very helpful thank you uh the next person raji uh, you could come on board ask a question 
Hi, uh, thank you very much, Kumaresh. I've uh, used LinkedIn for like uh, quite a few years now. For example, I can see so much difference in LinkedIn like five, six years ago and the last two, three years. I didn't see as much of opportunities I could get like five, six years ago. And now in the last two, three years, now, uh, my startup didn't have funding. And now I see like in 2019, 2020, all my latest jobs are through LinkedIn. And I, in this whole process, I can see what you, uh, it resonates with me. Some of the differences, what you have done, actually I benefited from it. And what I had to also do is change the keywords in my own resume and like uh, highlight some courses I did. And also like, in fact, very frankly speaking, take out the year I graduated. <laughs> Right <laughs> to take that age bias out of the person looking at it. So I can do that because now I feel empowered to like, I say, if I write this, these are the kind of recruiters who are going to reach out to me. So I, I am like empowering by like understanding that this whole thing is based on keyword search uh, and based on like uh, my resume, my past experience and what I want to highlight and what I want to put down, right? Like my year of graduation. But as a system, I'm sure like a lot more uh, intelligence goes into it to eliminate that kind of bias. And I want to understand uh, how you're working towards it. Uh, it's a great question. By the way, uh, one thing that was consciously trying to make this session was not a LinkedIn sales pitch. So I apologize. <laughs> it came out that so, way. Uh, yeah, um, I attest uh, to that. Uh, and because I had stopped using LinkedIn after 2014-15, uh, and then I was trying a startup. And then after a few years, I said, let me try LinkedIn again. And it was a complete different uh, experience. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I hope some of these insights um, from like, I guess the practical application of machine learning, you know, correcting biases can apply to your fields in, in ways that I could relate to with LinkedIn. And that's one of the reasons for getting into like that level of depth uh, with, with the LinkedIn topics. Uh, as for uh, age, as well as we see several such biases, um, Raji, it's, it's crazy. Like just the profile photo um, can cause so much bias. So much so that one day um, we had this crazy idea that we should replace all these photos with just superhero, like cartoons, right? And the challenge we had, believe it or not, was that we only had white males as superheroes that we could pick, <laughs> which in turn will perpetrate its own bias. <laughs> um, so you know, we were like, where it's it's a massive challenge, um, and it's clear that LinkedIn has this responsibility of of, of continuing to solve it. Uh, the one thing I can tell you is that we are moving towards measuring uh, biases across each of these dimensions. Um, you know, age, race, gender. Um, ability, physical ability, right? To make sure uh, people with disabilities aren't, uh, aren't discriminated against. Um, this eth ethnicity, um, economic strata, right? Um, and then skill strata, the you know, frontline, middle skilled, high skilled. Um, these are all dimensions making it an incredibly complex multidimensional problem. Um, the, the one thing I can tell you is that um, with every change we make, the one principle that we are holding ourselves to is that it will make, it'll, it'll not make the bias any worse. Uh, and that's a start. It's not gonna like, you know, solve the problem overnight, uh, but if we see an experiment that we run show massive gains in like business value, but is creating just that tiny bit more bias, we are now taking a step back and looking at that experiment more closely to understand why that's happening and see if we can adjust for it while preserving some of the wins that we get uh, on, on the business side. So that's the kind of, I guess, change that over time will hopefully lead to, uh, to more positive outcomes. Got it. Thank you.
I appreciate your work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Raji. Thank you, everyone who uh, chimed in with your questions. This was this was uh, this was an amazing session. Uh, I think this is probably a good time to, uh, you know, call it a day, and uh, thank thank Kumresh for his time. Thank you, thank you for uh, you know joining us, making this happen. Uh, thank you to uh, KG and uh, Karthik uh, and everyone else who's uh, Shanta ma'am and everyone else who's involved uh, in the Sigana activities and uh, you know uh, pushing to make make the CG CG alumni base uh, giving giving it a concrete structure. I mean, it's not like we don't have the alumni base. I mean, this is something I've been ranting, ranting about since last night to to KG Kumresh. Uh, that it's it's not like we don't have great alum, alumni. I think what is missing is the structure. So so I think Sigana is doing doing a phenomenal job in trying to provide that structure. Now I think it's it's up to people like us to make sure the structure reaches out to everyone and most importantly current students at CEG who see this as as one of the biggest pillars of support that they have once they get out into the wild wild west. As uh, Anand pointed out, you know once you're out of school. Uh, it's 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 wild country out there. <laughs> this, the, you no longer have the structure. So hopefully, uh, associations like Sagana or even the Indian arm of the alumni association gives you that form of structure, that form of stability that you can rely on as you navigate your professional and even your personal life for that matter. So thank you, everyone. And I had great fun. Thank you, Kumresh, for doing this. Uh, KG, if you want to say any closing words, the floor is all yours. Or Shanta, ma'am, if you have anything. Oh, I wanted to say thank you, Naveen, for holding a great, uh, engaging and interesting fireside chat with Kumaresh. Enjoy. Uh, yeah, you're, uh, you're most welcome. Just one part. Uh, I, I think we had like some of the toughest questions to Kumaresh today, and I, 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 I'm really happy that he was very sportive. And uh, also, immense thanks to Naveen, because it, it started everything from there. And, uh, everyone else joined today. I'm very glad you, you all joined and I hope you liked it. Please keep supporting us so we can do more. Uh, it's, it's all the network now. We need, to, we need to have more conversations like this. Thank you so much. Just right. one thing, uh, guys, sorry to keep you much longer. Um, oh, no problem. Thank you for this uh, to all of you. Um, I can't wait to co-host um, more prominent alumni. Thank you for creating this platform. Um, Foggy and I are already talking about how we go about this. So excited. Right. Yeah, looking forward to holding more sessions. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.